everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the 2020 Podcast, Canada's number one optometry podcast. And more importantly, welcome back to the future of Canadian optometry series presented by Aqueous Pharma. I'm very excited to bring you the sixth and final episode in this series. And just to do a really quick recap, in case you missed it, there have been five previous episodes with five leaders from various organizations that have a footprint in the Canadian optometric industry. We kicked off the series with an interview with Dr. Alan Alsifer, CEO of FYI Doctors. Next, with Dr. Darian Angle, VP at the Iris Visual Group. The third interview was with Mr. Bill Moyer, GM of Specsavers Canada. The fourth interview was with Mr. Rick Gad, President of Essilor Canada. The fifth was with Mr. Alfonso Cerullo, President of Lens Crafters. And as I've mentioned before, if you've listened, you've heard me say the sixth and final episode is with Dr. Carrie Salzberg. I wanted to wrap up this entire series and make sure that I got the perspective of independent optometry. I don't want this to look like a big advertisement for all the various corporations that we could potentially work at, right? I want to make sure that we hear from the, a successful independent optometrist to hear what it takes to become successful in the Canadian market, what it's going to be, what it's going to take for us to remain successful moving forward into the future. And Carrie definitely is the perfect person to talk about that. In this interview, one thing that I love is, you know, one thing I ask from every guest is for them to be candid. And as I've mentioned already, some, some guests were candid and some were not. Carrie is about as candid as it gets, does not hold any punches. And that's exactly what I would love to hear from him because I think it's time for a bit of a wake up call for us as ODs to understand what it's really gonna take for us to make sure that we are able to elevate our profession, what it's gonna take for us to maintain a high perception for the value of the service that we provide in the public eye. So as always, I'm gonna ask before I get into the episode, the same thing I ask with every episode, which is that I hope you share this with our friends and our colleagues, whether you post it on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, or send a text message with the link so everybody can tune in and hear today uh, Carrie's perspective, as well as all the previous perspectives from our past guests on the Future of Canadian Optometry series here, presented by Aqueous Pharma. So here is the episode with Dr. Carrie Salzberg. Dr. Carrie Salzberg, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here for this special conversation about the future of Canadian optometry here on the 2020 podcast. I really, really appreciate you joining me. Thanks for having me. I know this is a long time coming and I'm glad that we could uh, work this out on a Tuesday evening. Thank you. Yeah, well, it was well worth the wait. Definitely you're top of the list for uh, this particular very specific conversation that we're going to have because you are the sixth and final installment in this series, uh, the future of Canadian optometry series on the 2020 podcast. Uh, and I deliberately wanted to keep you for the end because at the end, I wanted to have the conversation rounded out by speaking with an independent optometrist, someone who's been successful in that realm, specifically as an independent um, and can showcase, you know, how ODs can do um, as independents and what it takes to succeed. So uh, definitely you're the perfect guest for this. And I was more than happy to wait to make sure all the stars aligned. So thanks again. I'm looking forward to this. This should be interesting. Yeah, great. So. Uh, Carrie, as you probably know, um, and, and and anybody who's tuning in for the sixth episode now, I'm sure is familiar that a few months back, I put a call out to the industry, to the profession uh, through the podcast. And I did deliberately name some organizations, uh, you know, by name to, to have them come forward, to invite them on the podcast to talk about what is the future of Canadian optometry? What are these organizations doing to support the profession of optometry? Uh, to make sure it continues to grow and thrive. And, um, you know, I've had I've been fortunate to have some great guests, leaders from these different organizations who can give their opinions from their different perspective than the, the average optometrist really will get to see normally, right? Um, but I also feel like, again, you're in that position in a slightly different position than many optometrists with the type of practice that you have and, um, you know, the, the, the way that you practice. Um, so, you know, and I know that you're going to do this already, but I'm, I'm inviting you to be as candid and open and share as much as you possibly can. And I'm not afraid that uh, you're gonna be too secretive about anything. But the first question that I've asked every single guest is, in your opinion, what is the current state of optometry in Canada? I mean, I think the current state is, is one of uncertainty. I think, uh, you know, in Ontario, we're going through this OHIP process, negotiation process. Um, we have 
staff shortages, associate shortages. We have all these new players coming in. So it's, a, I think, a, a big free for all right now. And, and with that comes concern and uncertainty and anxiety. Um, I think the pie may be getting a little bit bigger, but uh, the slices are getting much smaller. And, uh, you know, we've heard about spec savers coming in and all these online players. Um, I, I think that the, the dust will settle. I don't think the market is big enough to accommodate all these new players. Um, and you see this with, you know, in, in, in the stock market with marijuana stocks and, and uh, you know, pizza parlors. And, you know, if it's too good to be true, the strong will survive. And I think that's for, for us to decide who's going to survive. So I think right now, uh, I, gathering from talking to a lot of colleagues, um, there are concerns, and, and I, I think that that's 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 good to have those concerns. You can't be um, you can't be myopic. You can't have the blinders on. You have to know who your enemies are. You have to know who your your allies are. Um, but right now, I think the state with COVID going on, um, you know, and we're starting to get the patients coming back into the practice. I think there's a little bit of apprehension and, and just anxiety. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Uh, you touched on a lot of different. Uh, aspects there, topics there, which we're going to try to unpack a few as we go through. But um, obviously, that that is definitely there is a, a feeling or a sense of that some sort of a negative uh, feeling. I can't, you know, anxiety is a word you use. I, I I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but some sort of disarray happening in the profession. Are there positive things that we can look at right now, currently? That you know, what what's something that you would look at and say that's a really good thing in our profession right now? I think we like the the future is bright. I mean, I think there are so many niches. When you think of optometry, when my dad was practicing, he was doing refractions and 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 dispensing glasses out of a drawer. I mean, he couldn't even yeah. showcase that. So we've come a long way. Um, whether it's myopia control, macular degeneration, uh, aesthetics, low vision, uh, dry eye, we have so many specialties. So. Um, you know, we can create our own destiny uh, and, and the future is ours in terms of figuring out what what you enjoy and, and, and how you create a niche, because I think that's what's going to happen. I think the generalists are, are kind of dying. You can't just, you know, switch dials all day long. You have to have a specialty in order to differentiate yourself. So um, the, the products that are coming out, the technology, the lenses, uh, contact lenses, I mean, you know, I have ADD and, and I'm like... <laughs> constantly, you know, being bombarded by all this stuff. And when I graduated, it was kind of a stale profession. Yeah, you had some new um, content, daily disposable contact lenses, uh, and that was exciting. But now it's just coming at you at a million miles an hour. So I'm excited about all the opportunities and the technology that that will be born uh, out of a lot of these these uh, new new niches that we're, we're seeing right now. So I think the future is bright. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, you know, we're not running for the hills, but you have to be very careful in terms of how you plan the next 5, 10, 15 years. You have to have a plan. You have to have a direction. If you're just going to be a one-person operation, uh, spinning dials and, and, and trying to compete in terms of, of uh, you know, the optical and, and contact lens market, I think you're going to have a tough go for the next five years. Um, but if you, if you can create a, a service um, that, that not many people in your area are, are doing, then I think you're, you're going to be fine. So I think it's just planning and not just not practicing in a room, not practicing in a 10 by 10 room and not practicing in the dark. You have to know what's out there, the competition that's coming in, um, you know, get online, figure out what some of the new services that are, are being offered. Um, but I, I'm excited. I think, I think the next 10, 15 years in optometry are going to be transformative and it's going to be completely different than what's going on today. That's good to hear. Uh, definitely good to hear uh, that somebody like yourself feels that there's, the, you know, the, the future is bright and there's a lot of positivity to take away um, and things to look forward to as long as we're proactively kind of building that selves for ourselves. But to go back to what you said earlier, enemies and allies, I'm, I'm curious to tap into that a little bit. Uh, again, if you're comfortable sharing, who would you slate as those people in the profession right now? Who should we be looking at with Kind of a bit of caution, and who should we be looking at as potentially, you know, supporters for the profession? You know, somebody told me once that the shoe market was X millions of dollars um, before Zappos came came around, and the shoe market now is twenty times that. 
So, you know, Zappos to the old cobbler would have been competition. So I don't really look at, at um, as all these new players as being competition. I think it's going to expand the market. I think there's going to be greater awareness, greater education. Certainly there's going to be some pain as new players come in and it, and it may be a race to the bottom in terms of pricing points. But by, by creating awareness of the harms of blue light and, and UV and the importance of getting an eye exam, I think it only can help us. But there is going to be some turbulence over the next couple of years, uh, no doubt. I mean, I think the, the fear is that Specsavers has very aggressive growth plans. There are going to be 200 plus locations in a span of two years. I mean, that's tremendous growth. So, I, you know, I think we have to be aware of the competition, but I think that you just have to up your game. Um, and I think the, the greater awareness will strengthen the profession. That's why I think the pie will get bigger. It's just a matter of how much independent optometry will have a slice. Now, do I think that online um, businesses are good for the profession? Probably not. Um, but, you know, I, I do look at it as every person that comes into the market, there's an opportunity for us to get better, to get stronger and to be better business people. Um, so it's a kind of a kick in the pants to, to get your game on. So I'm not really, you know, maybe I'm insulated. I'm not really concerned about any of these players. I practice in a different level, not in terms of my, my, my skill set, but in terms of I have a very focused and laser focused direction in terms of where I see my practice. And although we're successful and we grew from one doctor in a, in a room about this size, the whole practice, to now over 10,000 square feet with 40 staff and eight doctors, yeah. um, I'm not resting on my laurels. It's always what's next. What do I have to do to better myself, to provide a better patient experience? And I think having this competition fuels that and, and makes you think about, well, how am I going to survive? How am I going to do? How am I going to compete? So I, I'm not worried about the competition. I'm aware of the competition, but definitely not worried. Well, definitely, I feel like we've had a, a, a few kicks in the pants <laughs> over the last decade or so. Uh, but you're right. I agree. Sometimes if you could take it that way, you know, you just take it as like a little bit of a wake up call. Let's let's start thinking about new ways to 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 um, to practice, to serve our patients. Um, on that note, I did an unofficial poll. I don't remember if I mentioned this to you. I think I did. When Specsavers, you know, was kind of announced that they were coming into BC before they'd, I think, officially opened any stores yet, I started texting colleagues across the country asking, uh, or if I saw them in person, like, you know, in your opinion, uh, what is your initial sentiment of Specsavers coming to Canada? Positive, negative, or indifferent? Right. And uh, the result was one positive, I think, I think about 40 results, 40 votes. Um low 20s like 23 negatives and like 17 16 indifferent mm -hmm. uh, so obviously skewed pretty heavily to one side uh and so i would probe each person ask them you know why are you negative why are you indifferent and the 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 thing that sort of the way that it all sort of uh seemed to flush out was the people who were, were indifferent were generally speaking uh, practices, pra practitioners like yourself, business owners like yourself, who are, are doing well or comfortable, or they're think forward thinking, they're growing their business, and they're saying, "I'm not worried about my business." Like from a business perspective, um, but the the people who were negative were some were worried about their business, but the big chunk of it, they were worried about the profession as a whole being devalued. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about that? Do you feel that there is a reason to be concerned about that side of things? The the whole profession sort of being devalued by a large player that perhaps may be, um, you know, bringing down kind of what is the perceived value of, of, of optometry. Yeah. I mean, I think that speaks to what I was mentioning before, which is the generalist doing refractions and a soot lamp and, a, and an OCT. Um, yeah. There's going to be pricing pressure. People in order to get a, a chunk of that pie, uh, you know, there will be a race to the bottom. I know that some, um, retailers are offering $80, $90 exams. Um, you have spec savers that are offering OCT and power to them. I mean, they, they figure out that, that a lot of doctors are charging for this and for $95 or whatever it is, and includes an OCT. Um, so in, in that respect, in terms of the optical, the contact lens and the, and the general eye exam, um, you're going to have to do something and, and we, we have to make sure that we don't commoditize the eye exam. We've already done it with contact lenses. To an extent, we've done it with glasses. Um, you know, it's the Zara or HMN 
H&M factor, which is, you know, just disposable goods. Um, but there's also a little bit of backlash. Now people are going, you know what, I want to buy quality as opposed to quantity. Um, and so I think it's important that you establish relationships with your patients. That's something that may not come as easy to some of these chains and, and online players. I mean, lifelong relationships are super important. Uh, listening to your patients, being curious with your patients, um, establishing. I think the biggest thing is listening. If, if we could do a better job listening to our patients as opposed to, you know, dictating recommendations and treatment plans, um, I, I think that we can regain some of the lost market share. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that these chains are basically commoditizing the exam, which I don't think is is in anybody anybody's best interest. So we have to be concerned about that. But our fees have gone up, um, and and I think that's the right thing to do. It sounds counterintuitive, but I think if you are offering value, if you if you know, when patients say it's too expensive, what they're saying is it's too expensive for the service that, or product that you're offering. But if you can show value, even though it may be more expensive, um, it's not always about the lowest cost dollar. So I think if we if we really up our game plan and provide something that nobody else is doing, I think we're safe. And I think everybody has to do that to survive. So... When someone's in your office and they've had an eye exam and they're at the end of the process, they say, wow, that was worth 200 bucks, whatever. Right. It's just, I'm picking, I'm deliberately trying to pick a little bit of a higher number. I know that's uh, not as high as some people charge, but it's, it's more than what I charge. Um, so let's say 200 bucks for an eye exam, but they felt good because they went through the process. They got all the tests. You listen, you, you really serve that patient. Well, that was 200 bucks well spent, but what about before they even walk in the door? So they're seeing that. Uh, one of the chains does a $90 eye exam, 95, let's say it's spec savers, they include OCT, um, but somebody else charges 150, 200. How are we going to, to show that patient at that point that there's a difference? It's tough. And I don't think a website cuts it. I don't think listing your service. I don't think that resonates. People don't know what a visual field exam is or a cover test. Um, I think it's word of mouth. I think you have to start, if you're starting fresh, yeah, you, you have a little bit of a problem. You have to do something. You cannot be a refractionist. You cannot just do standard eye exams. So whether that's vision therapy or pediatric, you have to differentiate So if you're starting. Now, if you have a full contingency of, 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 of patients and you have thousands of patients, then it's your job to make sure that those patients don't migrate to these chains. And you know what? You're going to lose some. I know that I've lost some where they go once or twice to a chain and then they come back. And you know what? That's a good lesson. I can, I can afford to lose those patients to, you know, as, as part of a, a you know, a fact finding mission. Um, but you, you have to, it, it's, it's all about service. And, and I think that patients, as much as they don't like paying more, I think it's easier when I'm charging the fees and I, some of my colleagues are charging, I would say a third higher than what I'm charging the expectation that it's good quality um, because they have no other way of comparing it. If they know that somebody's $250 versus 95, there's an expectation that there's a differential. And if they hear it from other patients that, Oh, you have to go to eyes on shepherd. They, you have to go to, to your practice. Um, there's our, they've already been pre-sold. So I think the, 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 the worst thing that doctors can do is bring down their pricing. I think if anything, you have to go the other way around but but create service and value that the patient is, is able to feel and, and to pick up on. What's up, guys? I just wanted to take a minute to give our exclusive partner for the 2020 podcast, the Future of Optometry series, a shout out here, Aqueous Pharma. Aqueous is a Canadian pharmaceutical company with a simple mission. Scour the globe for the best products and make them accessible to Canadian ECPs. The Evolved Intensive Gel is an artificial tear containing more drops per bottle than any other brand its size. Each drop is 28 microliters, which is the optimal volume for coating the eye without overflow. Its triple action formula contains sodium hyaluronate at the patient preferred concentration of 0.2%, pure glycerol, which helps to support the lipid layer of the tear film, which is excellent for MGD patients, and cross-linked carbamer 980, that binds moisture to the ocular surface and extends the drops residency time. 
as important as what's in the drop is what is not in the drop. The Evolve Intensive Gel is preservative and buffer free, avoiding phosphates and citrates, which have been shown to sensitize the human conjunctival and corneal cells. So why do ECPs love partnering with Aqueous? Because they don't sell directly to patients, nor can their products be found in drugstores or at grocers or on Amazon. Patients can only purchase directly from your clinic or your website. Recommending ECP exclusive brands helps to support our profession, helps to build your practice, keeps your margins healthy, and keeps patients within your continuum of care. There has never been a better time to evolve your practice. To request your product samples, contact your Aqueous rep today by emailing contact at aqueouseyecare.ca. That's A-E-Q-U-U-S iCare.ca. And don't forget to put the 2020 podcast in the subject line so they know you heard about them right here. And now back to this episode of the Future of Canadian Optometry series here on the 2020 podcast, Canada's number one optometry podcast presented by Aqueous Pharma. So what do you think are some of the forces? Obviously, you know, we, we hear about consolidation. There's, you know, companies like Specsavers coming from overseas. There's online. What do you think is, um, what do you have to be uh, as, a, as, a, as an independent or as an associate doctor working at, where at somebody else's practice? What do you think may be the biggest threat right now to the profession? Um, or is there one, you know, generally speaking? I think what you mentioned before, the word indifferent. If you're indifferent, if you're, if you're resting on your laurels and just, you know, you have this annuity, you make X number of dollars every year and you really don't have to worry. You're going to ride out the storm and, you know, I'm retiring in 10, 15 years. I think this profession is, is in trouble. But if you see this as a stimulus to get better, to learn more, um, to market more, to merchandise better, um, I, I think it's great. I think it's 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 a wake wake up call for the industry that has historically been complaining about a lot of things, but making a lot of money, making a good living. And I think I think the the ability to generate X number of dollars a year without working hard that's over. Um, I think you're going to see a practice erosion. Patients are going to migrate because you haven't provided them with something that that they can they can value. Um, but I, I think that if you really, as an independent pra practice, I'm able to pivot and be so nimble. If I see a new device or new product, I can literally with, you know, have that in a day. And, you know, our practice has been known to carry all the, the latest technology. So one of our, one of our advantages or value added is that every time a patient comes in, they're going to be exposed to new technology, new product offerings. And so I think that's important because we only have you know, touch points with these patients every year, some practices every two years, you better have something different so that they can really judge that you're a progressive uh, practice. Um, so again, I, complacency and indifference will be the deathbed of optometry. I love that answer um, because obviously the whole, the direction I've been taking this whole thing is that there's something else out there that's the, going to be the death of optometry. But what you're what you're telling me is that we need to look inside. We need to look within and and 100%, fight that. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, I like that. Thanks. I pre I needed that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so on on a similar note, do you think there's so you know big part of this this call out this sort of this 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 series of podcasts that I have is asking these corporations and organizations what are they doing to support the profession? Do you think they have any responsibility to actually support the profession of optometry? No, I don't think it's their mandate. I don't think they have any responsibility. And I think that ultimately it comes down to the almighty dollar. At the end of the day, they have to appease shareholders and their investors. Um, and uh, I think it's it, it can be ruthless and cutthroat, but I don't think they need to support. And I, frankly, um, I think if these companies are saying that they're supporting optometry, I'd uh, be scratching my head and kind of thinking, mm, I don't know about that. So I, I don't believe that. I think that ultimately these players are here to make money and to seize market share and that's it. So when an optometrist as an associate, let's say, actually as an, as a potential business owner, because you know, um, with Specsavers, their, their model is that you, you know, own the, the practice in some, some respect. Right. Uh, um, 
what should they be looking at, in your opinion, when they make a decision to go work at this corporation or that organization or own a share in that practice? Do you, do you have any thoughts on like how they should make that decision or whether they should go independent or become an associate at an independent practice? What, for the, if we're looking at from the independent, that, that OD's career path, but overall profession for the benefit of the profession as well. Well, I think it comes down to freedom of practice, how you see yourself. If you're being dictated by the corporation to, you know, really pump out prescriptions, um, you know, how much, what kind of, what kind of luxury do you have to bring in new technology, to bring in niche services that may not translate to greater net revenue for the corporation, but provide fulfillment for the doctor practicing. As I, you know, before we started, I said, there's no free lunch in life. And at the end of the day, all these incentives, these bonus offers, they will erode over time. We've seen it historically with managed care. We've seen it with spec savers and, you know, and no knocks against spec savers. I think, in, in fact, we should be applauding them. They've done a great job. Um, what a great business plan. And they've known how to tap into the consumer psyche. Um, so kudos to them. But I also know that if you're an optometrist there, there's probably going to be an erosion in remuneration for yourself over time, just as there has been with um, managed care. So as an independent practice and a practitioner, and I can dictate how hard I want to work, what I want to do, how much time I can take off, um, how much time I can spend with patients, what technology I want to bring in, what products I'm going to align with. So for me, being nimble, being able to pivot, and being able to, to really decide my own destiny is, is a big thing for me. I get it. You come out of school and you have $250,000 in debt, you're in a panic mode. You're in survival mode. You have to pay that back. So I can see the lure of going into some of these chains and new players. But at the end of the day, these companies are there to make money. They're not there to satiate your, your, your demands for, for uh, you know, what you want to make uh, per year. And, and, they will cut costs and 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 one of the best ways to do it is to take your percentage of whatever you take in and that becomes eroded over time so i'd be cautious uh if it's too good to be true it usually is and and, and i'd also do research I'd, I'd i'd contact um you know other players that, that have been working for chains and see what the, the pluses and the negatives are and I, I again i don't want to um I don't want to criticize any of these players because I think that they, they do have a business model. Um, but, you know, independent optometry is not for everybody, uh, nor is working for a chain. But, um, you know, that's what makes the world interesting. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the questions that I posed to each of the prior guests, because uh, obviously for our conversation here, um, I'm I like the fact that we're, we're kind of flowing through this a bit more freely, but with the previous guests, I had a much more structured kind of interview process. And one of the guests, excuse me, questions uh, was like, you know, companies are handing out these incentives. So for example, when I spoke with uh, Dr. Alsifer from FYI, I said, well, you're, you're giving these new grads uh, forgivable loans. And when I spoke to Bill Moore from Specsavers, I said, you, you have these big salaries for some of your locations. Like, do you think it's, actually this these students because the, the the new grads who have the leverage and the power or is that just sort of being clouded and are their their career paths and the career decisions being kind of blinded a little bit by the money the, do, the dollar signs and uh you know interesting to hear kind of the mixed response depending on if a corporation did have one of those incentives or if they didn't uh but you know coming from an independence perspective your perspective here uh sounds like you're 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 feeling like Ultimately, it's not the, the OD who has the power in that decision or has the leverage, really. Yeah, I, th I think you just have to decide on the destiny that you want. I, I Like whether you're with Iris or FYI um, or in a buying group or in working with these chains, the fact is there's a cost for that. They're not just being nice and, and helping you grow your practice. Often there's a, you know an issue. You don't want to deal with the administrative duties of a practice. You've been practicing for a couple of years. You just want to kind of sail it to, into the sunset and just see patients just have a, well, there's a cost for that. Um, now, they, you can leverage some of their uh, vertical integration and, and their cost savings on stuff. So, um, you know, the, the salaries are commensurate with maybe what you made before. As an independent, I just feel that I can dictate 
what I want to make, how I want to practice. And, and I love, I love the administration. I love being able to meet with my doctors and meet with, with management and decide where our practice is going to go. I, I just don't want to be governed by uh, a corporation that says, look, we have to improve our revenue or decrease costs. And I don't want to be part of that equation. Um, so I look at it more from, you know, how much money I can make to what kind of life I want to live. Um, and, and I think that's very important. Again, that dollar is a, as a big lure, um, loan forgiveness is a big lure, but you know, that's fleeting that, that two or three years where you you've removed some of that pain, there's a cost for that. You either pay now or pay later and, but you always pay. And yeah. so it's, it's a difficult uh, decision to make. Yeah. And we were saying earlier, um, I think offline, but the demand for ODs, you know, I, I was saying one of my pain points these days as a business owner is like, I can't find associates. Like it's hard to hard to find people to come and work in general. It seems there's a shortage, but the, or a, a really high demand, whatever you, however it is. Um, pendulum really seems to have swung one way. Yeah. Um, and I mean, usually when that happens, it swings back. Like, is that what you see at some point? There's, it's got to reach a peak and then it's going to somehow come back. I mean, if you put on your 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 uh, your future goggles here, what do you see in that regard? Well, I liken it to the real estate market. You know, uh, a month ago or two months ago, um, it, it, it was a seller's market. Buyers could not afford. And now like that, it just transitioned. So that pendulum analogy is very fitting because I think I don't know where these associates have gone. All I know is that there was a cry that there were too many optometrists in the marketplace and too many schools graduating optometrists. Um, I think that as a practice owner, you have to be very careful in terms of who you bring on. Um, you know, right now, it's, if you have a pulse, we'll take you. But I don't know it, that again, that has long term consequences. So I think you just have to take a breath. And you have, first of all, a lot of doctors that are bringing on associates do not need associates. They haven't filled up their day. Um, so I think you have to do an analysis of your practice and figure out, are you better off not bringing an associate and just condensing your hours and, and maybe uh, working a four day work week instead of a, uh, a five day and, and having gaps in your schedule. So I think most practices that feel that they need to bring on an associate typically don't. So it, it sometimes it's a lifestyle, a lifestyle issue. Um, but I think that everything reaches an equilibrium. There's, there's homeostasis and, and, and there, and there will be, I just don't think it's right now. Um, I, I think that this is a very turbulent time for bringing in associates, for finding staff, for finding qualified staff, for finding staff that lasts more than two or three weeks. Um, and, and the pricing pressures to bring on those staff. I mean, you can have somebody that's, that, is should be paid twenty dollars an hour, and they're asking for twenty eight dollars, and they're not yeah. worth that extra eight dollar premium. So I think you just have to be on the sidelines right now. And and there's so much uncertainty. Marketplace doesn't know what's going on. The stock market is 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 in in a quandary right now. Are we going to be in a recession? How bad is inflation? Are the rates going to go up? I mean, there's so many things that are uncertain right now. So I think you just have to take a breather, just kind of tread tread water right now and um i i think there will be some sort of equilibrium that that happens but it's it's tough it's tough for 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 independent businesses for sure yeah yeah for sure it is but it will be it will be interesting um to see how it all plays out in the next i don't know i, I can't imagine this this the way it's heading keep going this way for more than another year or so but we'll see how it it all, it all plays out or, or what kinds of changes will come about um you mentioned this earlier. You feel like the future of optometry is bright. Yeah. What do you think the job, an optometrist's job, will look like 10 years or 20 years in the future? You know, I, I think that a lot of the stuff that we do will be online. I think the technology is really improving. I can see where companies are going with delegation and having your staff. A teleoptometry thing is going to be huge if you're in a rural setting. You're going to have a reach of, you know, probably twice or three times your, your current population pool just because of teleoptometry. Um, I, I think I think the whole profession is going to be different. I, I, I think that we're going to be using drops to treat myopia and, and molding new corneas. I think we're going to be using light therapy to treat all sorts of diseases that people can do at home. Um, I think people are going to be able to do self-refractions. And that's not 
I mean, these things shouldn't be scary. They're opportunities. And I think that we just have to be, we have to be current. We have to make sure that we understand what some of these potential threats are. Um, but I think what we're doing with the equipment that you see behind me, I, I think that's going to be antiquated. Um, you know, I, I just, I really don't know, but I, I can tell you that going to conferences and seeing um, just in terms of the future of lens design and, and um, imaging technologies, I've, I've had the privilege of seeing the latest in OCT scans. We're talking going from 100,000 megahertz to 400 uh, megahertz and, and, and taking basically panretinal scans in, in 10 seconds. I think the the, the fundus uh, exam, the traditional fundus BIO exam, will be a thing of the past. Thank God, because um, <laughs> I think you're going to be able to, with a click of a button, take a 360 degree scan, anterior, posterior, everything in between. Um, and I think that's four or five years away. So, um, a lot of change. You know, think about it. Optometry from 1920 to 1980 was basically the same profession. And then you had soft contact lenses, then you had disposable contact lenses, then you had great designs and multifocal imaging technologies, myopia control, um, all sorts of things. So I can't imagine what this profession, but I think I think this is parabolic. I think that we're just on, on that, that hockey stick um, upturn. And I, I think that that's why we have to be excited, but we have to be knowledgeable. We have to go on the internet, go to conferences, talk to colleagues, and find out what's the latest and greatest and grasp on to something. Don't wait for everybody else to be doing it. You know, nobody remembers the second person on the moon. They remember the first person on the moon. <laughs> and, and I think that we also have to be able to part with our money. I see so many doctors complain about how much money they, they, uh, they uh, make, yet they're driving fantastic cars, going on luxury vacations, having cottage properties. And I think that for every dollar you put into your practice, you can easily, the return on investment of that can be two, three, four dollars. But people are very apprehensive to invest in their practice. You have to invest in your staff, invest in your practice. And the, the, it's just, it, it, it's exponential in terms of the growth. Um, so when new technologies and, and, and new products come out, embrace them. The worst thing you can do is you have a paperweight. Um, but the best thing is you can offer new services and get clientele that way. So yeah. just, just embrace, embrace the future. There are some potentially very expensive paperweights out there, Carrie. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, you, if you don't put them to use, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, I've had, we have pretty much every piece of technology and, yeah. and probably duplication. <laughs> I won't get into the company that we did, uh, did business with, but there, there was one device that just didn't live up to its expectations. Um, but it pales in comparison to all the, the equipment that has brought not only value to the doctors, but to the patients and has increased revenues. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't think there's anything in our practice that I could live without now. now you know, we're one of the first ones to bring in, in wide field imaging, and I'd be lost if we didn't have that. The same mm -hmm. thing with OCT, the, thing, the same thing with digital uh, autophoropters. Um, you know, I can move my shoulder now. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm starting to get a little pinch going here. It's taken a few years, but uh, you know, one one of the words you said in there has come up in almost every interview, interestingly enough, and I've never really uh, expanded on it, but the word delegation, that word has come up a lot when I asked that question about the future of our profession or future of, you know, what an optometrist job is going to look like. So what does that mean? And is that something we should be afraid of? No, I think that pay, people judge, patients judge, the exam based on the one-on-one -on -one interactions that they have, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes, the perceived value can often be 20 or 30 minutes. So I think that as the, the patient goes through the gate of tests, um, they're spending upwards of 15, 20 minutes just doing pre-testing now. Think about it. You have your visual fields, you have your wide field imaging, you have your refraction, tonometry. And if you're doing VA uh, and, and some, some uh, doctors are delegating refraction, which I don't think is a, a, a bad idea. But it's, it's, it's getting all that data and then understanding it and then communicating it with the patient and, and as opposed to typing in stuff. I mean, one of my big pet peeves is not facing the patient, facing my screen. And, and up until about four months ago, I was still 
writing on paper charts because I could do this and still face the face the patient. So I think um, I think scribes are very expensive, and and as much as I think they're great, I think in the next year to two years you're gonna have digital scribes. You're gonna have offsite scribes. So I think. I think delegation is the way to go. Your time is valuable. And whether that means seeing more patients per day or seeing less patients uh, per day and just having a lifestyle bonus, I think delegation is important. And you got to train your staff. I think gone are the days where patients expect you to do every procedure. Um, and I think that that's how businesses run efficiently. Hmm. And then as part of that, uh, the teleoptometry, as you mentioned, you know, the, the upside is expanding the reach that we will have and the number of patients and geographically, you know, how far we can reach. But on the flip side of that, you know, are we afraid of, of, um, should we be afraid of, you know, corporations being able to do the same thing, first of all, uh, and secondly, you know, AI and other things, interfaces like that, potentially kind of replacing the role of the doctor in settings like that. And again, with the digital refraction, you know, I saw something about alternative coming through the FDA, getting some sort of FDA approval in the States just recently. Uh, you know, so that's obviously coming. Um, sh should we be afraid that we're going to be kind of kicked out of this picture entirely? No, just embrace it. Just embrace it. You can't, you know, the good old days of practicing, putting up a, a sign in front of your office and be guaranteed an annuity, whether you're a good doctor or a bad doctor, those days are over. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be at the cutting edge or you have to be at least aware of it. And, and we own those patients right now. It, it's, it's for us to lose those patients. So unless you are progressing your practice and maybe doing things that are uncomfortable to you, getting uncomfortable to be comfortable later on, I think you're doing yourself a disservice by not being aware of these things. Uh, there's nothing that that is coming out that is scaring me. So long as we can figure out that opportunity that that new service or new technology provides. Um, yes, corporations are going to do it because they're going to chase those dollars too. But I think that that the benefit of being an independent and, and running your own business is that you have a lot of skin in the game. You care and you have great relationships with patients. And I'm not saying that you can't be an optometrist at Costco and have great relationships, but I think that's the one main advantage that we have is that we have trust, we, we listen, we're curious. You know, I'm sure you're the same. How much time of an exam is spent talking about their vacation and the restaurants that they've been to and their family and how's Billy doing with softball versus doing the exam? But yeah. what the patient perceives is that you're turning all these dials and you've done an exam and you've spent the majority of your time getting to know a patient. And what a wonderful opportunity. I mean, if I was a dentist, I'd go crazy. <laughs> you, we could talk, but we, we couldn't get any feedback. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the 20 conversations that I have a day with my patients and they value that. And I think that there's, they're willing to spend a little bit more to have that one-on-one, -on -one, especially with COVID and be, being secluded and being, outside of many social circles, I think it's a great opportunity to kind of bring them back into the foray of public life and having those conversations, checking in with them, seeing how they're doing. So yeah. in answer to your question, embrace technology, embrace change. It's the only way that you're going to survive. That's a great answer. So I think you've already kind of hit this throughout the, the interview here, but if you were speaking to a, a, a student, pre-optometry student, or, you know, looking for a profession to go into yet, what advice would you give that student? Make sure you understand the profession of optometry. Um, you know, work at, 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 you know, volunteer or go into a variety of settings to understand where you see yourself. Not everybody's a, a business person. And some people just want to check in and check out. And that's, and that's fine. But understand what the what the, the the future of optometry is going to look like. Some of the competitive pressures, um, and, and make sure that that this is the right thing for you. Uh, I, I think knowing what I know now, I would absolutely go into optometry. I think it's so exciting. And and again, for somebody that, that is you know, oh, there's something shiny. I, I love it. I mean, I'm, I, I you know, we went to um, Mito in the spring. And talk about a trade show. I mean, I was just wired. It's just so 
the, the, the amount of money that these companies are spending on introducing new products, it's just, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. So um, I think there's no better profession. If you're in the healthcare professions, I think optometry, and I, I'm not just saying this because we're having this conversation and I don't want to sound like I'm hundred percent upbeat because there are days where I go home and go, what the hell am I doing? Um, but I think that this profession is, is incredible. And I'd love my kids to go into it. I, my son wants to be a baseball player and, uh, uh, slash optometrist. So we'll see what happens there. But for my kids that want to go into it, I, I, I'd welcome it. I think it'd be great. I had the fortunate um, pleasure of working with my dad for 25 years and it was a great opportunity. I love that. And I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride and I have, I think a few more years to go. So yeah. I, I think hopefully uh, many more. I hope so. I hope so. So that, you know, that's actually, I, I appreciate that answer. Um, you know, interesting to hear that you would encourage your children to go into it. Cause that, that I think that always is the tell all at the end. Right. Uh, you know, when I'm talking to patients and they're asking, well, what would you do if this was your kid? Uh, I said that I'm always giving you the answer without you asking me, I'm always giving you the answer based on like, if this was my child, what would I do? Yeah. Um, but I don't think that, you know, I think in a situation setting like this on a podcast, I'm asking you this question. I think guests often feel compelled to sugarcoat the answer a little bit, make it, yeah. you know, sound nice to the optometry community, but that's not generally not the answer I want. And, and definitely not during this series of conversations, not the answer I want. Right. So I'd like to hear kind of genuinely, you know, if there's something negative that you want to tell that kid, you want to tell that 20, how old are you before you go to optometry? 22? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you want to tell that, you want to tell them, look, it's actually kind of harsh right now. I'm not sure. Or you want to tell them, no, no, stick with it. Cause 10 years from now, this is going to be an incredible profession to be oh, in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you look at the aging population um, again, you look at all the opportunities um, you can, you can be a salesperson, you can be, you know, medical optometry. There's so many different niches that you have. I think the one big challenge that we all face, and we talked about it before, is managing people. And, and you have to be a leader. Uh, you, you know, you can't be a manager. You can't be a boss anymore. You have to elevate your team. And, and, I, and to be honest with you, I actually love it when my staff decide that they want to venture into something else. Um, they want to go into real estate. Um, they've learned how to talk to people. Now they, they, they see a, a bigger, better future. You know, you got to let these, these, these people go. And, and, and um, so nothing is forever. So that means that there's a constant churn of, of, uh, of staff and you have to manage that. When you have a staff of, of 40 people, there's going to be three people that are out sick. There's going to be somebody that has to move. Um, the city of practice in Toronto, the city is getting prohibitively expensive. So, you know, to make that commute an hour and a half away isn't feasible. So, it's, it's a challenge, but it's also such a pleasure to see the ability to hire 40 people and, and for them to provide food for their families and for them to grow personally and professionally. I mean, it's wonderful. For other people, it's a headache. But I think to see people grow and, and to create this business family is, is, is great. Um, so, you know, to each his own. Everybody has a pain point. My pain point is... is um, making sure everything flows properly. I am a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to that. And I am, I get very nervous when I'm late for an appointment. It makes me crazy more than it makes my patient. So these are some of the stresses that I have, but you know, as long as you're working towards a goal to minimize those, um, you're good. Excellent. So Dr. Salzberg, any um, final words of wisdom you'd like to share on this topic of the future of Canadian optometry? I think that uh, just to my colleagues, um, don't bury your head in the sand. Um, get out of your 10 by 10 room. See what's going on at the retail chains. See what's happening in terms of merchandising. If you're if you have an optical gallery uh, in terms of marketing, embrace technology, embrace administrative technology um, and, and just be aware of the environment. It's not so scary, but when you practice in the dark and think in the dark, um, it can be quite challenging, um, but but we we are just so fortunate to have a stable of, of patients uh, that we have, and we just have to culture and, and, and nurture that patient base. And it's fun. We're doing this eight hours, nine hours a day. 
I want to have new technology. I want to talk to patients. Uh, granted, you know, this has been a long day for me. You get a little bit parched, but it's it, it, it's great leaving the office. And, and when you have a great day and your staff are happy and your patients are happy, what more could you ask for? I love it. That's a great, uh, great way to end the the podcast. And I, I appreciate you sticking around these late hours after work, after a long day to, to share your insights. Uh, Dr. Salzberg, thank you for joining me. And uh, thank you to everybody who's been watching. This is the sixth and final installment in the series of uh, the Future of Canadian Optometry series on the 2020 podcast presented by Aqueous Pharma on Canada's number one optometry podcast. Make sure you send me your messages, leave reviews, whatever. Uh, if you got something for, uh, you know, Carrie that you want him to know, shoot those messages over. Let's keep this conversation going. Maybe we'll have even more of these episodes um, in the future if we really feel like we want to ask more questions. But thanks again for joining me on this journey, guys. I appreciate it. We'll see you again soon. All right. There it was, the sixth and final episode, the interview with Dr. Carrie Salzberg, owner of Eyes on Shepherd. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found some really great insight like I did. As you could tell, if you listen to you watch, if you watch it on YouTube, you see the expressions on my face. But even some of the words that came out of my mouth, I was kind of like, oh, OK, I guess I got to get my act together, too. Uh, Kerry really didn't hold any punches. He really tells it straight. And that's exactly what I think we all need to hear is how do we as ODs, how do we as colleagues come together to make sure that our profession continues to grow and thrive in the future? I hope you found a lot of insight. If you haven't heard any of the previous interviews, please go back and check them out. Once again, there's five other interviews with Dr. Alan Alcifer, Dr. Darian Angle, Mr. Bill Moyer, Mr. Rick Gad, and Mr. Alfonso Cerullo, all prior to this interview with Dr. Kerry Salzberg, all right here on the Future of Optometry series presented by Aqueous Pharma on the 2020 podcast, Canada's number one optometry podcast. I hope you've loved this series, guys. I hope you give me as much feedback as you can. And I'm very open to uh, as much constructive criticism as you can provide because I want to continue to make this better. And as I said before, there's a chance that I'll have some of these guests back on. So if you think there's something I missed, I'd love to get back into it with them with any of the questions that you'd like me to ask in the future. Thanks again for joining me on this ride. It's been a really great journey. I've learned a lot. I hope that there's been value in this for you, all of you that uh, has helped, that will help us as, as colleagues, as professionals to continue to grow. Thanks again for joining me, guys. I'll see you in the next regular episode of the 2020 podcast right here. Take care.